Hello, uh, I'm Daniel Rittelsberger. I work for Swisscom CSERT, but this talk is not about Swisscom. I'm presenting private research. Uh, you wrote a little tool uh, recently, Xnumon, um, to monitor macOS for malware and intrusions, and I'd like to present that work to you. I'd like to start off with a little quote from Apple. MacOS doesn't get PC viruses, and its built-in defenses help you keep safe uh, from other malware without the hassle of constant alerts and sweeps. So I guess that's the end of my talk now. <laughs> but on a more serious note, things have changed, I guess. Um, and looking at Malpedia, uh, repository of malware families, um, there's 37. Mac, uh, malware families for Mac OS currently. Um, there's everything from ransomware, uh, adware, there's banking trojans. Um, I've highlighted those malware families which are attributed to state actors. Um, it's not the most scientific method to uh, motivate research like this, but uh, I think it's good enough. Uh, I feel that a Mac shouldn't be the weakest target in your organization. Uh, we can also look at the Mitra Attack Framework. Uh, it's an interesting resource um, cataloging techniques and tactics of adversaries. I will not go through all of these now in detail. I just picked a few at random, which are relevant on macOS. Um, you will notice that many of them involve running uh, command line utilities, which is something that is very noisy if you have monitoring similar to Sysmon on Windows. So speaking of Sysmon, a lot of organizations use this tool on Windows, Sysinternals tools at, from Mark Rusinovich. Um, very powerful, can log a lot of very interesting information. Um, most notably process creation, but also a lot of other things like driver loads, uh, registry, uh, you name it. Uh, this is an excerpt of one of these events. Um, those of you who look at malware regularly will know which one this is, I guess. Anyone care to guess? Oh, I heard in three was the solution to the last question. <laughs> anyway, this is Retifi, um, banking trojan, which downloads and installs uh, SoCat and Tor client. And this is the the persistence that starts uh, via MSHDA XA, the SOCAT, uh, which redirects traffic from the browser to the Tor client. These are things that you can see in these events. So when using these to monitor large fleets of systems for malware and intrusions, um, typical setup for Windows looks like this. Uh, you deploy Sysmon on the endpoints, servers, uh, workstations, laptops. You collect these events into the local Windows event log. You forward them somehow to your central log collection infrastructure. Um, and they end up at some point in an analytics platform where people like me uh, query them for, well, to find uh, attackers, to find infected systems, to do log forensics after a breach. Uh, it's a very, very valuable tool. So assuming you're an organization that has these capabilities deployed on Windows, um, we would like something similar for the Mac, right? We have all the pieces already in place. Uh, the only thing that is kind of missing is the agent that produces locks which are similar to locks produced by Sysmon. There are commercial solutions. Um, but they usually come with a lot of other infrastructure as well, and they, they don't fit so well into an environment that you already use Sysmon in. So I set out to find a solution to this problem. Um, but before that, we need to think about what we actually want to monitor when we look at processes. And I want to focus on processes because that's really the core of a monitoring solution like this. All the other events somehow relate to events 
um, well, to processes in the end that perform certain actions on a system. So on macOS, the situation is maybe slightly more complicated than what we're used to from Windows. Um, you probably heard that Mac, the Mac kernel um, is a combination of Mark and BSD and IOKit. Um, so you have the Mark part, the lower bit here, uh, which is really the scheduler. That's where the threads live. That's where virtual memory mappings live. That's where IPC live, uh, lives, uh, the Mark messaging. And then you have the BSD bits taken from FreeBSD glued on top. And they provide all the things, basically, that you see from user space. Uh, things like processes, uh, things like user IDs, uh, the networking stack, file system, the Unix security model. And you have both parts of the kernel exposed to user land through different mechanisms. IOKit is just a driver framework that Apple added to this, a more modern way to write device drivers that's less relevant to our question here. But the thing is that we have different things that are similar to processes at different levels. So at the very core, we, at, on the mock level, we have, we have the tasks, which is the entity that mock uses to uh, keep the memory mappings and uh, the threads. Uh, they're part of these tasks. Then on the BSD layer, we have processes. And finally, in, the, in user space, we have AppKit uh, and Cocoa applications, um, which are kind of different entity as well. But what we're most uh, interested in are the actual processes. So luckily, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between BSD processes and mock tasks. Uh, they're just kept in parallel in the kernel in different structures. Um, when you, for example, use PS to query the list of processes, uh, that's, that information is taken out of the BSD part, the BSD bookkeeping of processes, um, whereas the scheduler that actually runs the code on the CPU um, uses the task, the, the, the mock task list uh, to, to do its work. So what we're still looking for a way to actually monitor or get information about new processes being started, right? Um, so the relevant calls here on a Mac are fork and exec. Uh, I guess most of you know about that. It's kind of operating systems uh, basics. Uh, then there's the newer POSIX spawn, and then there's the mock specific task create call that is used to create one of these lower level tasks. I'll just quickly go through them. Um, fork and vfork are used to create a new process, but they don't load an actual executable image. So what you usually do to create a new process is you first fork that kind of clones your process as it is, exactly as it is, and then in one of the processes you call exec to load a new executable image. So that's the, the first pattern I list here. But that's not the only way to use these two calls. On Windows, this is one system call, but on Unix you, and in this regard, the Mac is a Unix system, um, you can combine them in different ways. So you can exec twice in a row, for example, um, if you're on a system where you get a bash as a login shell, you don't like bash, but you're not administrator, you don't have the rights to change your shell maybe, uh, you can replace your shell by executing a different shell. Um, or you can fork twice, which is the traditional way to detach from a terminal and start as a daemon process. Uh, there's also patterns related to network programming. So the traditional way to write a network server is to fork, uh, to fork your pro server process for every incoming connection. And then more modern ways, well, modern, <laughs> this is all pre-multithreading uh, techniques. So 
uh, people started optimizing that, writing pre-fork. So first, doing a lot of forks, uh, having a pool of processes ready, so they don't need to be started when connect, uh, connections come in. But anyway, the key message is we can't just rely on the fact that there's always fork and exec in that order uh, used exactly in the way that we would like them to. Uh, POSIX spawn. Um, this is a slightly more modern interface. It's kind of like fork and exec in one system call. Uh, but it has lots of options, um, and you can actually use this with certain options to behave like only exec. And it has lots of other options which might be interesting if you do low-level programming, like starting a process suspended. And then finally, and luckily for us, uh, there's mark create task that you can also call directly from user space, but luckily it was disabled by Apple at some point in time um, because a lot of things assume that there is this one-to-one -one relationship between a process and a task in the kernel. So under normal circumstances, we can safely assume that um, it's sufficient to just monitor processes and not tasks, even though in theory in the kernel they could exist independently. So what do I want to monitor at process creation? Uh, what information do I want? Um, fork creates processes, but I'm really interested in the image that's loaded, the uh, executable. Um, I'm interested in the path. I'm interested in the arguments that are used to start it. I'm interested in hashes of the executable image on disk. Um, I'm interested in the code signature. And I'm interested in which executable image started which other executable image. So not exactly the process hierarchy, but which code loaded which other code, kind of. So this is something that you could see uh, on a system, but uh, let's say the normal, uh, the, the lower part is not exactly normal behavior. The PowerPoint spawns a shell that does wget. But I want to be able to see such relationships between process um, create operations. Um, and just a little detail on the side, there's this nifty way to run a script um, by using the shebang. You can put hash, uh, exclamation mark, and then interpreter at the top of a script. If you do that, you can actually run the script directly as if it were an executable. Uh, that's uh, very normal on a Unix system. But it's actually the kernel implementing this feature. It's not done in user land. So the exec syscall is actually different. In the first case, when you run the interpreter explicitly and then give it the script as an argument, you have an exec on the interpreter. And in the second case, the exec that goes into the kernel actually directly references the script file. And then behind the scenes, the kernel does some dirty tricks um, and the end result is the same thing. It's the interpreter bin shell um, given the script name as an argument. So from an instant response perspective, I would like to know both the interpreter and the script and not just the information that happens to be passed to exec. So I went and looked at some existing solutions. Uh, that I would quickly kind of share with you, also because they're interesting projects. Uh, there's Google's Santa, uh, which is an awesome project if you can and want to do actual binary whitelisting on your fleet. Um, it has a kernel module that basically stops processes from executing uh, until the daemon that goes with it takes a decision whether it's okay to launch that program or not. Uh, there's a GUI part, and there's uh, the ability to sync policy with a policy server. Um, one very interesting policy server is based on social voting. So you basically, uh, you crowdsource your decisions, <laughs> whether a binary is okay or if it's malware. You kind of crowdsource your malware analysis into the to your employees <laughs> running your Mac systems. Um, I'm not sure that might work at Google, <laughs> but uh, 
for many organizations, perhaps this is not, uh, I'm not so sure about this, but it's an interesting concept. Um, but you can also do monitoring because before you want to block things on a fleet of Mac systems, you need to know what's actually running on them already. Um, so it does a lot of, uh, it can acquire a lot of interesting data, especially the hashes of the images and the code signing information. Um, however, it's not so good at other context information. Um, and one thing I would like to highlight is the parent PID at exec. So consider this code. Uh, it's a very simple fork and then exec combination. Um, first, we print the PID of the process calling fork. And then in the child process, we sleep and then print the PID, the parent PID of the child. So you would expect that the parent PID of the child at exec time is the process that called fork, right? Um, but it's actually not. Uh, this is because while we sleep in the if clause there, while we sleep, the parent process exits. And when the parent process exits, the child is left without the parent and is kind of sent to the orphanage. So it's, it gets reparented to process ID 1 to launch D on a Mac. So when we just look at the parent PID at the time when we call exec, we lose some information uh, regarding relationships between processes. So anyway, can Santa solve my problem? Um, ye, not really. <laughs> um, I wasn't satisfied with it. Um, there's a lot of missing information. It's awesome for whitelisting, but not really the perfect solution for monitoring. Then a second tool I looked at, uh, Facebook OS query. So this as well is an excellent project. It's a cross-platform um, solution to kind of treat your systems as a database. So you can query pretty much anything on a system as if it were a SQL database. And that includes processes and a lot of persistence mechanisms actually. Uh, this is an example. So this query is the table that has all the currently running processes, combines it with, with a special table that calculates hashes from files on disk. And this way we can see the hash of the executables that the processes currently running are pointing to. We can do the same thing for code signatures. So this is very interesting. Um, however, there's a small problem here. Um, we need to consider short-living executable images. So on Windows, um, I don't know if you know that, but on Windows you can't actually, under normal circumstances, delete your own executable image as a process. If you do that, you get access denied. The file on disk is locked by Windows while it's executing. That's why you have these funny batch files uh, that you see in malware sometimes that they use to delete themselves as a workaround. Um, so you can assume that while it's running, you still have the data on disk. Whereas on a Unix, you can actually unlink the executable file from disk um, as the first thing you do as an executable. And if you do that, you have a process that has no, well, that still has the data on disk that was used to start this process, but you can't access it because it's not linked in the file system anymore. And you can even uh, write to your own executable image while you're running. This will not crash your process, at least not immediately. So I would, when acquiring, I mean, why am I telling you this? When acquiring an image hash, or a, a code signature information. I want to do that at the exact time of the exec and not some point later in time because it could have changed. So back to OS query. Um, it was a bit more difficult to dismiss the idea of using OS query as a replacement for Sysmon. Um, but 
image hash and code signature acquisition is unreliable, can produce the wrong, wrong results um, because of this uh, timing issue. And then there's not really good image ancestry. Uh, it's all just parent PID, which is not, uh, which is far from, from what I'm interested in. Um, and then there's a number of implementation issues, especially with the process auditing code, but that's not, uh, that would be fixable. Um, so in summary, it's a very cool tool, but it doesn't exactly solve my problem. So I checked the third tool, something that's actually pre-installed on every Mac. Um, if you've done Solaris in your past, maybe, um, you might know the BSM. Uh, it's available, it's an audit framework that's also available on other platforms. Um, Apple implemented this to achieve common criteria certification. Uh, basically, the kernel produces audit records for a lot of low-level events, including full sysmon, uh, sysmon, sorry, uh, full syscall auditing. Um, stores these audit events or audit records in the kernel where audit daemon uh, gets them and stores them to disk in a binary format. Um, by default, this just locks authentication related information, um, but it's actually running by default. So when we enable auditing for exec here, um, we can see that there's a lot of interesting information here. We have the arguments. Uh, we have the path to the executable image. We have file attributes of the executable image. Uh, unfortunately, no hash, no code signing information. And we have the subject, which is the process that actually executed this syscall. But it's very low level. It's uh, really syscall level. You need to understand the syscalls to make sense of this. Um, but neat is also that it includes the IP address that is associated with the terminal that this process is attached to. So you can actually see for remote logins the IP address where this is coming from. So very interesting, but it's kind of not a drop-in solution for Sysmon. It's too low level, too much information. Uh, there would be a need for a lot of post-processing um, of such records to, to create the context that I'm interested in. And also there's the issue that it doesn't cover the mock side of the kernel as well as the BSD side. Um, so this is not really a direct solution to the problem. So I started thinking about how to write a tool to solve this problem. And went through a number of APIs that could be leveraged to achieve that. Um, there's libproc. This is uh, Apple's API to, into the currently running processes. Uh, it doesn't have events, so you just see what's currently running on the system. Uh, that can be helpful, but it's not a solution. Uh, on an AppKit level, there's this thing called NS Workspace did launch application notification. <laughs> um, this actually only covers the, the top level in the schematic that I showed earlier. So it, it does notify us, or we can use it to get notified on application launches, but not for lower level processes. That's just things that you actually click in the user interface. Um, so it's, it could be a partial solution at best. So search went on. We have KQ. Um, that's an API that um, was primarily designed to replace select, to be more scalable than select, um, to scale network servers to thousands or ten thousands of open sockets at the time or open file descriptors or whatever. Um, but you can also use this facility to monitor processes and some other things like vNodes. Um, you can attach to a specific process. Say, I want to be notified when this PID does a fork, exec, signal, or exit. Uh, the problem is um, there's like no context, almost no context. You don't get any information. You just know that this happened, but you don't have uh, information on it. So not so cool. Then there's uh, audit pipe. 
that's kind of the programmable API um, onto the same kernel facility that Audit Daemon uses to retrieve its audit record. So I can open that device. I can tell it which events I'm interested in from the kernel. Um, and then I get all these events and can do with them what I want as a process. Uh, it's still subject to the global policy or some aspects of the global auditing policy. That's a bit tricky, but otherwise this is very powerful. Uh, the only thing that's missing here is a reliable way to, well, you can't uh, acquire image hashes or code signature information through this facility. I also looked at Dtrace. Uh, that's also an extremely powerful uh, facility coming from uh, Solaris. Um, you can trace syscalls, process events, a lot of things in the kernel. You can access kernel internal data structures with this tool, um, beyond even what you can do in a kernel extension according to Apple. So it's, it's more powerful than what you're allowed to do as a kernel extension. Um, there's this little programming language that you can write uh, traces in, and this is an example of how to run it um, to get one line of information for every exec that happened. In this case, it just prints the PID. So this would be perfect. However, Apple broke this when they introduced system integrity protection uh, because it leaks too much information from the kernel, uh, for example, to uh, determine the the random address offset of the kernel. Um, so they removed some capabilities from this, which basically means it's not as useful as we would like it to be for this use case. Uh, in this case, I tried to access uh, the arguments that the kernel has at the time of exec, so the arguments the process was started with, and that fails. You can use it, but you need to disable at least at least parts of system integrity protection, which is not really an option if you want to deploy something on a larger scale. Well, it's not really an option for my laptop either, actually. Um, then there's KDebug, another very powerful facility that you can use from user space. Um, it's intended for debugging. You can attach, uh, you can kind of monitor which functions get entered and left in the kernel. Uh, it has access to a lot of very low-level kernel things, including mock messaging, a dynamic loader, XPC. Um, you can access it with the trace utility if you want to play around with this. Uh, it's used by a lot, lot of tools by Apple, like instrumentation app. Um, it's very low-level, as you can see. Uh, for the fork, it's kind of you can guess that these are the two PIDs. But for the exec, I'm not so sure what the information here is, uh, what these addresses translate to. Um, and it's very undocumented. But the main problem is that you, there's only one um, process that can use this facility at a time. So if we would use this for a monitoring agent, um, the Apple utilities that use this would stop working. Not an option. So I went and looked into ways to solve this problem in the kernel. Um, there's the, the better way to do it is the kernel author, authorization um, API or KPI, kernel programming interface. Um, it does cover exec very well um, via the vNode. Um, so you can actually get a call back every time the kernel calls exec on a vNode with all the information that we're interested in. Problem is you can't track fork with this. But on the positive side, we can use this to pause a process and then let it continue later. This is the Apple kind of official way to write an on-access AV scanner for the Mac. Then there's the Mac framework. Um, <laughs> there's a bit, there's too many things called Mac, 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 Mark. Um, this is Mac, uh, meaning mandatory access control. Um, this is a concept where you stick Mac labels to different kernel objects and later do policy decisions based on these Mac labels. 
Uh, this is actually how Apple implemented their sandboxing feature. Uh, the, the, this would be perfect for our purpose. It covers exec and fork, uh, even before and after they happen. Uh, the problem is it's not a supported KPI, meaning while you can use it in a kernel extension, it's not uh, binary compatible or not gu guaranteed to be between different versions. And Apple threatened to take this API away from kernel modules at some point. So it's not really a long-term choice. And of course, um, we could just... Uh, do the bad thing and just mess with kernel internal things directly. Um, it's doable, it would be doable for one version, but it's not something that I would like to maintain or support across uh, other people's systems. So not really an option. So I went and uh, wrote my tool. Um, and this is the result, or at least partial lock of an image exec event, so kind of the equivalent of the process uh, creation event of Sysmon. Uh, it has argv, it has the image with hashes, code signature information. In this case, it's unsigned. It has information on the process which caused this image to load, uh, including the full history, the full ancestry of images again, including um, hashes and code signing information. Um, this is actually the Mac version of RTFE to go with the Windows version we had before. They use the same tactics on both operating systems. They use SOCAT here to redirect traffic to this Onion domain. This is the overview, how I did it. Um, I mainly use dev audit pipe um, because that's the best use space API, most reliable that we could find, I could find. Um, and there's an optional kernel extension. It works without the kernel extension, uh, in which case uh, the acquisition of hashes and code signatures just happens at a later point in time, so we could be too late. Um, but under normal circumstances, you would still be able to acquire all the information. Um, but with the kernel extension, the kernel extension blocks the process from executing until the user space utility had time to acquire all the information. It has configuration kind of similar to Sysmon, but in Apple plist format. Um, and it's able to log events to SJSON or YAML uh, currently two files or syslog. Uh, the kernel extension is also very useful to work around a number of bugs that I found in Apple's audit framework in the kernel. Um, it sometimes reports things wrongly, uh, so missing information. Um, having a kernel module helps working around that. Problem is it's unsigned so far because Apple is very restrictive uh, in handing out certificates which allow to sign kernel modules, um, which is good for security, but it's bad if you want to improve security with a kernel module. Um, I'm working on that. Um, the agent currently has these capabilities. Um, there's two event types which are not super interesting. It's just for monitoring the status of the agent and some metrics. Um, to identify problems. Uh, the three lower ones are the actual useful events that are currently implemented. Uh, image execution, uh, process access, and launch daemon, launch agent added. I will quickly go through them, but we already talked about image execution, so I will just skip this. Uh, we have event code three, that's, um, that's a very interesting one. Um, there's this call called um, task for PIT that you use to go from the process to the mark task. And when you do this, when you receive the send rights to a mark task, you can actually modify that task's uh, memory, for example. You can kind of, it happens also when you debug. You open another process, you mess with it. Um, basically, it's how you implement debuggers. 
process hollowing, injecting code, um, all these things that we want to see um, on systems. So this actually, this event actually locks this um, syscall, task for bit and ptrace. Ptrace is kind of similar. It's very limited on the Mac, so it's not so important. Um, but still, um, that's, yeah. Then we have event code four. Um, that was more kind of a proof of concept for file-based events. Um, this triggers whenever some process adds uh, launch daemon or launch agent to one of these locations. Um, it's, it doesn't cover any other persistence methods, but a lot of malware currently does use these. So this is interesting to have. So yeah. Um, next steps, I would like to further improve configurability. It already has a lot of, um, or some ways to, to whitelist certain processes, to suppress certain logs. Um, but it, I, I feel it should be a bit more configurable even which types of events you want or you don't want in your environment. And I have been running it on this laptop for a few months now and on some other systems for testing. Um, I would like to do larger scale deployment soon, hopefully with a signed kernel extension. Um, and of course, it, there's lots of potential to extend it with more types of events, uh, like monitoring the opening of network sockets. Um, something I would be interested in is uh, image loads in, in the sense of libraries. So to get an event whenever the kernel load or the dynamic loader actually, <coughs> sorry, uh, loads a library as part of loading an executable. Um, and some other more specific things um, like environment variable based uh, dialib injection, um, different log formats, impash, uh, whatever makes different people happy. So this is it. I released this today. I uploaded it already to GitHub. You can play around with it if you're interested. Um, find bugs. <laughs> um, hopefully not too many. Um, yeah. I would like to open the floor for questions. Great, thank you very much, Daniel. Very awesome, interesting talk. Uh, we have still around five, seven minutes for Q and A right now. So, does anyone have any questions? Please raise your hand, and I'll come bring the mic to you quickly. Awesome, crowd participation. Come on. Thank you very much. It was a. Uh... It's, a, it's an amazing tool. I was waiting for something like that for ages. <laughs> I had the same pain points that you went through, so uh, I, I understand your pain. It's a lot of work. Um, do you actually implement the upstream collection of logs to, say, Splunk or any other SIM solutions? Is it, is it part of the... You know, do you have an agent that pushes these logs somewhere? Yeah. No. No? Okay. Um, the idea is to... Well... It, uh, I'm more of a follower of the Unix philosophy, do one thing and do it right, and leave the log shipping, log collection to different tools which are better at that job. So the tool can log to different facilities, uh, currently to syslog, to files, or to standard uh, output. Uh, so that should cover a lot of use cases, uh, but it's quite easy to add a new transport into the code if you have some kind of agent um, that wants to pick up locks in a different way. Yeah. But I I use um on this system locally Splunk just from var log from files. There's also a sample configuration on how to pull the log format into Splunk in the GitHub repository. Cool. Anyone else? Any other questions? Don't be shy. Thank you. Oh you're making me work today, huh? Yeah, I, does it have any measurable performance impact? I mean, pausing the process before you hashed it, this would add some latency or something. 
Um, obviously, it does. <laughs> um, I have some measurements if you're interested somewhere. Um, yeah. So uh, it does, but there's a lot of caching built in. So it only needs to acquire the hash and the signature information once, as long as the file on disk doesn't change. And because you only run, well, on this system, and I do a lot of kind of shell activity on this system, there's only like 300, 400 binaries in total that I run normally. Um, so it's not that many. It's, you can easily, easily cache that. Um, but here are the timings. Um, at the bottom you see the timings for the cache lookups in comparison with the actual acquisition of well, either just MD5 or SHA-1 or combinations of those uh, for different sizes of, of executables. Um, the and obviously, it, it, the time grows, the larger the executable gets. Um, the biggest problem or the biggest impact are large applications like Microsoft Office uh, applications that are huge binaries. Um, but uh, yeah, there is an impact, but um, I can't quantify it precisely, but personally I didn't uh, see any impact um, for my own use. I cool. don't know if that answers the question, but Cool. Any more questions? We still have a little bit more time. Anyone else? Oh, nice. Do you have already a roadmap regarding extension of this tool regarding network connections? Uh, roadmap as in at what date it will be available? No. <laughs> it's ready when it's ready or someone implements it. It's an open source project. Uh, it's not something, it's something I do in my, in my spare time, so. But there's maybe ways to motivate me to prioritize that if you're <laughs> <laughs> interested in that. Anyone else? Any more? No? Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, yeah, we'll have a round of applause once more.